depth by the edge of the sword. Their weaknesses was turned to strength. They became powerful in battle and routed whole foreign armies. Women received their loved ones back from death, raised to life again. But notice, notice, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free so that they might gain an even better life after the resurrection. Some were mocked and made fun of publicly while their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. And others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended and earned a good reputation for their faith. Notice this. Yet none of them lived to receive the fulfillment of all that God had promised. You say, what is the message here? The point is, it was their faith in the Lord God which enabled these saints to persevere and endure under such afflictions, even unto death itself. But they did this, watch this, they did this without having even seen the promise, all the promise of God come into actual reality and existence. Are y'all getting this? You say, well, what is that? We're talking about the new covenant. We're talking about the coming Messiah. We're talking about the Christian faith. They did all of that without even coming to see that happen. Amen, somebody. But notice why this was. Notice verse 40. Because God had us in mind. Did y'all get that? God had us in mind and had provided, notice, something better for us so that they, these men and women of authentic faith, would not be made perfect, that is, completed in him without or apart from us. Amen, somebody. Understand then that Christ Jesus is the reality of that new covenant, which is built on better promises. He is the reality of all of the Old Testament shadows of things to come. As shadows cannot exist without a reality. Christ himself is the essential bond of union, if you will. It is his blood which binds together the saints of all ages. And therefore, God in his infinite wisdom purposed that all those who live faithfully, get this, faithfully in their time of persecution under the old covenant, based on his promise to Abraham, would not be perfected without us and without the better thing, the new covenant, the Christian faith, the coming Messiah, the kingdom of God, the church of Christ, which we, by the grace of God, through faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, now actually enjoy and are a part of. They lived faithful to a point of being sawed in half based on the promise 
of what you and I now enjoy and are a part of. Some of us don't even know what we're a part of. Colossians 2 says this. Go with me. Colossians 2. Because I just mentioned that Christ is the reality of what they look forward to, how they live by faith. Christ is the reality of that. Amen, somebody. So in other words, we're living in that reality that they hope for, that they live faithful unto. Amen, somebody. Notice this, Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 11. We're looking at Colossians 2, 11 through 17. Colossians 2, 11 through 17. When you have it, say amen. amen. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Are y'all getting this? Christ performed a spiritual circumcision. The cutting away of your sinful nature, for you were buried. What, 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 what was that, that surgery? What was that surgery in? Notice, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. That's when the surgery happened. All right? And with him, with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave all your sins. Aren't you happy about that? He canceled the handwriting of ordinances against us and took it away by nailing it to his cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Notice this. Get this now. Verse 16. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbath days because they still had Judaizing teachers trying to, trying to tell them as Christians you still need to keep part of the law. Amen, somebody. So he says, don't let no one condemn you in this. Amen, somebody. Don't notice verse 17. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come, and Christ himself is that reality. Is that all right? He is the reality. And this is why I would like to call your attention this morning to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, as you and I are encouraged this morning to live like you have something to look forward to. Let me say that again. Live like you have something to look forward to. I'm so thankful for our class this morning, Brother Yukon. Life without God is meaningless is the new lesson we're in in our Sunday school. It is based on the book of Ecclesiastes and how you and I, amen, somebody, even as children of God, we need to come to recognize that without God, everything is meaningless. And some of us, even in Christ, we've been in Christ for years and we're still empty. We're still unfulfilled, we're still unsatisfied, we're still searching for purpose and meaning, Lord have mercy. So I want to encourage us this morning to live like you have something to look forward to. You see, just as the saints of old, whose faith enabled them to endure, even to the point of death, without having even seen the promise, you and I also must take God at his word, 
trust that he's able to deliver? Trust that he's able to deliver? Trust that he's able to deliver? You say, why you keep saying that? Because whether he does or not, he's able. Is that all right? So we trust that he's able, not that he will or he won't, but he's able to. Is that all right? And notice, trust that he's able to deliver and endure to the end. Notice this. Even in the face of overwhelming obstacles. I heard someone this morning in class said that they still unfortunately feel empty. Lord have mercy. And we just need to be honest. Because sometimes we do feel empty. Sometimes we feel like we have no purpose, no meaning. Amen, somebody. Notice then our admonishment, our encouragement as those who are now actually a part and those who are in the kingdom of the promised Messiah. For the context, I want to start with Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Is that all right with you? Notice what he just finished talking about in verse in chapter 11. We read that earlier, right? So now he picks up chapter 12 and verse 1 and says, notice, Therefore, and this is strong and emphatic, considering what he just said, therefore, are y'all getting this? Therefore, considering those saints who were sawed in half, who were stoned, who had to live in holes in the ground, who had to live in caves, therefore, amen somebody, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses referring to them, but understand this is just a figure of speech, all right? It refers to those back in chapter 11 who by faith kept their eyes on the goal while actively enduring, all right, even to the point of death. But when he says, seeing we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we have to understand what this means because many times we take this out of context. Okay? They are witnesses to us. To us. That we can live faithful to. They are not. They are not witnesses of us. Are y'all getting this? Because there's no knowledge in the grave. Are y'all getting this? So they're not watching us seeing how we're coming along, the only ones who's watching us to see how it all plays out, as the Bible says, is the angels in heaven. Amen, somebody. But those who have went on, they're witnesses to us and not of us. Are we getting that? Now we're surrounded by a greater cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. And the picture here is as of the Olympic Games. Games. Those who would run racist and things like that, they wore as little uh, garments as possible in order to make sure that they were not hindered or encumbered. Amen, somebody. So we also, in this Christian race, we have to lay aside every weight. And there's some things that you and I have in our lives, some things that we are out of our control, some things that are in our control. But nevertheless, there's some things, there's some weights in our life that we have to lay aside. Amen, somebody. And in, in, including that, in addition to that, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us. I want you to understand that the race is our Christian journey. And the race set before us is not a dash. It's not a sprint. But it's a long distance marathon. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? And, and I don't know about you, but if you ever watch the marathon, sometimes them runners have to stop and take a water break. They have to be massaged. They have to go through all these different things so that they can keep going. Is that all right? 
But notice this, it's a long distance marathon, but therefore understand that it's not to be run how you and I choose to run it, but rather how God himself has chosen and ordained for us how it must be run. You know why? Because there's no shortcuts in this race. Is that all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and the verses 24 and 26 says this. Verse 24 says, Paul said, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs but only one person gets the prize? So run in such a way to win the prize. We're not just running just to run. We're running to win. Then he says in the a part of verse 26, therefore I run, notice how Paul said he ran, I run with purpose in every step. Or another translation says it this way, therefore I do not run without a definite goal. So notice then as we hasten how God has instructed that you and I must run this race. Notice verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 12. He says, run looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. All right? And R before faith is not in the original, so it's really looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith or the faith. Amen, somebody. Now, let's notice what looking means. Looking means to keep on looking away from everything and anyone else. Did y'all get that? To keep on, not just one time, not just take a glance and, and just continue. No, no, we have to keep on. Well, I looked at Jesus last week. No, we have to look unto Jesus every day. Keep on looking away, but notice, as we look unto him, first off, we have to look away from everything and anyone else. Did y'all get that? Looking away from everything and anyone else, notice why. In order to see distinctly and to keep one's eyes fixed upon. If I'm looking at the cross, I can't fix my eyes on the cross when I'm paying attention to y'all. When I'm paying attention to all the, the high winds and the high waves around me, I, I can't run fixing my eyes on him trying to pay attention to everything and everyone else. Amen, somebody. Are we getting this? You see, he is the author. What does that mean? He's the source. He's the founder the chief, the leader, but he's also the finisher, the perfecter and completer. He is the one bringing the life of faith to its complete conclusion, consummation, accomplishment, and finish. How is that? Because he, ob he perfectly obeyed the Father's will. Amen, somebody. And you remember what he said on the cross before he gave up his spirit. He said, it is finished. Or in the original language, it is accomplished. Amen, somebody. And therefore, the point is this. Jesus is the one who has in his own person raised faith to its perfection and therefore as the founder as the originator of the faith and the only one to bring it to God's designed end notice he alone is the supreme and highest example 
of faith and perseverance. Yeah, we have all those who are witness to us that we read at the end of chapter 11. Amen. Somebody, all those who were martyred, those who live faithful. But Jesus is the supreme and highest example of faith and perseverance for all true Christian saints to follow. Notice then 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 23, encourage us in this way, encourages us in this way. For God is pleased when for conscience of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong, for wrong. In other words, if, if we're punished or mistreated for doing wrong, that's what we get. Amen, somebody. But if you suffer for doing wrong and you endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. Notice this. Newsflash, verse 21. For God called you to do good even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example. And notice, and you must follow in his steps. Suffering, affliction, adversity, challenges is what we were called to as Christians. So it's no surprise. Amen, somebody. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. He understands how heavy it is. How difficult it is. How challenging it is. With our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. Just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Understand then. The answer to why. Why you and I must keep on looking unto Jesus is found in verse 3 of Hebrews 12. When he says, consider him. Consider him who endured from sinners so much hostility against himself. Halo read earlier, or, or uh, yes, Halo read earlier in our communion from Isaiah 53, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was familiar with grief. Those were his two best friends, sorrow and grief. Amen, somebody. They accompanied him every day of his life. It says, notice, consider him who endured from sinners so much hostility against himself. Why? So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Another translation says it this way, so continually keep your mind on Jesus who put up with many insults from sinners, then you won't get discouraged and give up. In other words, consider him Consider him in comparison to what you and I go through. Because at the end of the day, not trying to be insensitive, not trying to minimize what you and I go through, but when we stack it up against what Jesus went through, it doesn't, it pales in comparison. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? So we need to fix our eyes. What does that mean? Through diligent prayer, diligent study, not just sometime prayer. Not just sometimes study. Not just sometime meditating upon God's word. 
Amen, somebody. I'm just not waiting. You should not just wait till things go wrong for us to start getting into the word of God. Lord, help me. Jesus. Is that all right? We need to stay in here because we're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or getting ready to go into one. And that's just the truth of the matter. We need to do this in order that we might become those who are serious about our faith. And that's what I really want to hit as we close. We need to become more serious about our faith so that we can endure, so that we're not walking around defeated because Christ has already given us the victory. As we always say, we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. The fight is fixed. So let's notice as we close, let's notice how the Lord himself was able to faithfully finish and bring his father's will to completion. It says, in verse 2 continued, who for the joy that was set before him. Did y'all get that? Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, first of all, in this context, let's understand that it is nearly impossible for you and I today to ever truly appreciate and comprehend the full shame, the full humiliation associated with the cross. The cross was humiliating. It was designed for pain. It was designed for torture. It was the, the designed for public shame for who for criminals murderers thieves for the worst of the worst but we can't see that because now today we're wearing it on on jewelry amen we have it up you know it, it means something we uh, we understand it it means something different but we need to sometimes go back to what it truly meant for our lord shame humiliation so when he says despising the shame understand what it it truly means and I, I got a new perspective on this now I got a better perspective it literally means to think or view down on and therefore it specifically speaks to an outlook having an outlook that regulates notice this that regulates your and my mind, amen, regulates our behavior, I'm sorry, regulates having an outlook that regulates our behavior, our outward behavior from an inner mindset. Are we getting this? Despising the shame. And this enables an individual to look beyond their immediate obstacles towards a source, a source of joy which is set before them. So think of Jesus. Has to go to a cross for me and you. And even before the cross, Lord have mercy, all of the mental and emotional anguish that he went through all of his life. Being rejected. Amen, somebody. Being abandoned. All of these things that we have thing, issues about to this day, all of us struggle with rejection. We struggle with abandonment. We struggle with abuse. We str struggle with feeling unloved, feeling unaccepted. All these things we carry even from our childhood. Amen, somebody. And that, that's what causes us many times in our lives in adulthood to try and seek things inordinately in order to compensate for what we're insecure about, for what we're inadequate about, amen somebody, what we weren't validated about, and we're trying to seek it in life, we're trying to seek it in relationships, we're trying to seek it in, in drugs, in alcohol, in sex, in food, in whatever, amen, and it will never satisfy you. No, 
notice. Despised and ashamed. In particular, get this. In particular, despised and ashamed speaks to shameful, painful, and disgraceful mistreatment, which is then disregarded, devalued, and paid little attention to as though it's nothing or seen as insignificant because of being esteemed lightly in relation to the ultimate goal and task at hand. So when it says Jesus despised the shame, in other words, all the shame, all the humiliation, he disregarded it because of what he was looking forward to. Amen, somebody. You see, while the joy that was set before him speaks to an inward joy, an inward delight, an inward gladness based on an awareness of God's grace. All right. So if I'm this mor- if you and I this morning are feeling empty, even as children of God, there's something wrong with the awareness of God's grace. We need some tuning to God's grace and how much favor we have in our lives. Amen, somebody. It speaks to the inner joy specifically with Christ in respect to Christ. It speaks to the inner joy of accomplishing God's eternal plan for the redemption and salvation for mankind as well as the glory, notice, don't forget this, as well as the glory which was to follow, which our Lord Christ Jesus always kept in view and set before him. And this is why even in the face of overwhelming adversity, nothing could ever detour Christ from the goal of accomplishing his Father's will. You ever notice in John 4.34, when he said to the disciples, the disciples were so concerned, they said, Lord, Master, sit, eat something. And he said, my meat, my food, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Then in John 8.29, when he was feeling, when the Pharisees were trying to uh, intimate that he was alone, that he was abandoned, that no one had his back, in other words. Amen, somebody. Jesus said in John 8, 29, because sometimes people do abandon us. People do leave us for dead. Amen, somebody. And sometimes you and I, even around a crowd of people, even though we have a lot of family, even though we have a lot of people around us, friends and everything else, we can still feel lonely. But notice what Jesus said. Notice his mindset. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do what pleases him. Amen, somebody. And as we noted before, and this is what's real shocking and profound. Even when Jesus was on the cross bearing our sins and the sins of the world. Even when he experienced separation from his father for the very first time in his humanity. In his humanity. Did y'all get what I said? Not as God, because God doesn't separate from himself. But in his humanity, he had to experience separation from his father because of my sin. Because of your sin. Amen, somebody. But even in accomplishing that, he never lost sight of trusting his father as his God. So that's why he said in Matthew chapter 27 and the verse 46, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In other words, he didn't say, God, why have you forsaken me? He said, my God. So he was still holding on to him as his God. Even in separation. And therefore, in the mind of our Lord, as we look unto him, the joy, the goal of accomplishing his father's will, far outweighed the shame of the cross. And this is why he goes on to say, a 
as we finish, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, I want you to get this. If you get nothing else, it's not about where you and I are physically, but what we have to look forward to now spiritually. Look with me in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse number 5. Prayerfully, this will sum things up for us. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse number 5. And when you you have it, say amen, please. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, even though he was God, did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. In other words, Jesus, as God, wasn't so high on himself that he said, I ain't coming down there and becoming my own creation to save these people. Forget about them. That's some of our mindset. Amen, somebody. But Jesus, amen, somebody, he didn't think it's something to cling to because he's already God. He can't cease to be God but made himself of no reputation. In other words, he gave up all of his uh, prerogatives as God. He didn't cease being God, but he gave up all of his uh, godly uh, prerogatives. He never in his humanity used his uh, deity to get him out of situations. He had to live life exactly like me and you. Couldn't snap his fingers to get out of depression, to overcome some anxiety for the moment. Amen, somebody. He had to get through it. He had to be the example for us of how to get through it. Is that all right? Are we getting this? Notice. But made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bond servant or slave, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, There is a therefore. Thank you, Father. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And therefore the point is this, get this now, just as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is of the utmost importance that you and I come to trust in God and in the fact that our present earthly condition is not at all a reflection of our heavenly position. Trust God in the fact that our present earthly condition is not at all a reflection of our heavenly position. This is why the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Notice this. And raised us up together and made us sit Together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let me read it from another translation so we can really get it. And he raised us up together with him when we believed and obeyed the gospel and seated us with him in heavenly places. When? Now. Now. Because we are in Christ Jesus. You say, wait, wait a minute. How can we be in two places at one time? Willie just preached about that a few weeks ago. I hope you listened. Amen, somebody. 
Well, let me give you some Bible just in case you, you, and you shouldn't take my word for it. Take the Bible's word. Philippians 3 and verse number 20. Philippians 3, verse number 20. Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, but our citizenship is in heaven. Amen, somebody. We got a passport, or whatever you want to say. Amen, somebody. We ain't traveled there yet. But our citizenship, we have dual citizenship. We're citizens on the earth, but more importantly, we're citizens in heaven. When, Mark? When the day comes? No, we got it right now. But the point is, if we don't continue to look unto Jesus, we can lose it. But our citizenship is in heaven. Notice, and from it, we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I want to leave you with a question. A very important question. Have you and I allowed our present condition in this life to cause us to become so out of touch with the reality of our spiritual position that we actually live our lives as if we have nothing to look forward to. Let me ask you one more time. Have you and I allowed our present condition in this life to cause us to become so out of touch with the reality of our spiritual position, which we just looked at, that we actually live our lives as if we have nothing to look forward to. And if we're honest about it, many times that's how we're living. We're living as if we have nothing to look forward to forward to. Amen, somebody. And let me say something to you about that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 to 19, he said, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we are of all men most miserable. If all you and I have to look forward to is the things in this life, then we're miserable. Because truly and honestly, as, as you kind of pointed out this morning, yeah, we enjoy things. We enjoy trips. We enjoy going out to dinner. We enjoy uh, get-togethers with our families. and things. We enjoy all that. But what's the meaning? We have to continue to do it again and again and again. It's not satisfying. We have to remember that our true essence, our true nature is spiritual. Not carnal, not human, not fleshly. Amen, somebody. So as if our true nature is spiritual, then we'll never be able to fulfill ourselves with fleshly things. So why are we even trying to? And as my brother said this morning, I'm not saying don't go on trips. Brother Parker preached we shouldn't go on trips. We shouldn't go out to dinner. We shouldn't enjoy ourselves. I'm not saying that. God has given us all things richly to enjoy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. But while we're storing up these things in this life, make sure we have treasure stored up for heaven so that we can make it. Amen, somebody. And that's why Peter said, watch this. Peter said, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, since everything around us, since everything around us is going to be destroyed, what holy and godly lives should you live as you earnestly desire and notice this, look forward to the day of God and eagerly anticipates its, its coming. In other words, some of us, when we're saying, man, you know, there's nothing in this life to look forward to, guess what? You sure right. There's nothing in this life to look forward to. That's why we have to be looking and living according to the joy that's set before us. 
Have you ever wondered that God sees fit for us to have a lot in this life so that we don't get too comfortable down here? Maybe if we enjoy things too much down here, when Jesus comes, we'll be like, hold on a minute, man. Can you come next week? <laughs> Amen, somebody. Have you ever thought like that? Let me look this way, because I don't want to embarrass nobody. Well, I, I'm, I'm hoping that he come, but I hope he come after I get married, or I hope he come after I do this, or after I graduate, or after I accomplish this. You see, the truth of the matter is that you and I greatly, greatly, greatly underestimate our ability or how our ability or how our inability to look forward profoundly affects the manner in which we live now. Did y'all get that? We underestimate how our ability or inability to look forward profoundly affects the manner in which we live now. So if I'm struggling, I really have to look at, am I living in a manner that looks forward? Because when I focus on what I have to look forward to, amen, somebody. The day is not so dark and depressed. But if I'm just looking at my bills, my children, my marriage, the church, and all these other things, I can grow depressed. I can be in despair. And mention all those things, but the greatest thing is me. Because sometimes we fail to realize that the greatest obstacle we have in life is us. I'm unfulfilled. I'm not happy with me. And this is why it's so important for us to look forward. Because when we look forward, then we can say like Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. And the time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. But notice this, and not only to me, pay attention, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for and eagerly look forward to his appearing. Some of us, unfortunately, will be shocked when Jesus comes back because we're not looking for him. So I just wanted to give you this message this morning so that we can check ourselves, stir ourselves up so that we can begin to start living in a manner that looks forward to the joy that's set before us. You hear this morning, you not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We say in all love and sincerity of heart, not being insensitive, not being condescending, but unfortunately, if that's your state this morning, you have absolutely nothing to look forward to. Only in Christ is this affording, and this afternoon we'll be looking at the promise of looking forward. Amen, somebody. So we implore you this morning, if you're here and you not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can come today having heard the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? That's what the old saints believed. 
They believed that the Messiah was coming, even though they didn't live long enough to see the new covenant, the Messiah being ushered in. They didn't live to see that, but they still live faithful unto death. Amen, somebody. And I just learned this recently. Many of us today go to Barnum and Balaam Circus, all this stuff, circus. But you know that part of the original concept of the circus in the Roman times, part of the enjoyment for the Roman people was the emperor gathering Christians and setting them in the Colosseum before the people and getting them to encourage them to renounce their faith in God and then they would be free. Or if they denied and rejected that, they would be thrown to the lions and tigers in front of all the people. And as we just read, the faithful died. They didn't turn their back on God because they knew they would have a better life after the resurrection. I'm so glad that's not my case today. I'm glad that they don't come down here and round us up and take us downtown. Amen. Amen. To where the calves play and sit us before the people and ask us, are you going to be a Christian or not? If not, we're going to throw you to these lions, lions and tigers. Amen, somebody. I'm glad that I don't have to endure that. But we do have to endure what God has saw fit for us to endure. And what we're enduring today is a lot of things that preoccupy us and cause us to lose our joy. Because we have so much else going on. You see, the devil is cunning. He's subtle. He knows how to get us. He knows that, you know what, I ain't going to even use fear tactics no more. I'm just going to get them involved and get them to love things more than God. That's the easy way. You can come. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God and God raised him from the dead on the third day. And then in obedience, be baptized for the remission of your sin and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For those of us who have obeyed the gospel, let us really live like we have something to look forward to because we do. We do. Consider that as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement. Thanks for the